In this video, we look at a simplified summary of the story North Carolina's Pioneer Treasure by J. William Rush, which appeared in the June 1979 issue of the magazine Western and Eastern Treasures. Deep in the heart of North Carolina lies a most peculiar rural town, Hendersonville. With its modest size of merely 7,000 inhabitants, this town possesses a most curious secret. Could it be that outside of Beverly Hills, no other town in all of America has a higher percentage of millionaires per capita? Indeed, it is said that over 700 millionaires call Hendersonville their home, a remarkable 10% of the town's entire population. But what is the reason behind this immense wealth? The answer lies in the geography of this small town, located atop a high plateau surrounded by lush farmlands and scenic mountains. The area around Hendersonville offers the perfect climate for growing apples. Early settlers discovered this fact in the late 1700s when they first arrived in the region. Over time, this little town became the ideal stopping off place for travelers from the Northeast en route to the farmland of Georgia, South Carolina, and Alabama. And in the summer months, Hendersonville became a haven for wealthy cotton plantation owners who settled along the Atlantic coast to escape the unbearable heat and disease of the nearby swampland. With time, two other groups of people discovered Hendersonville, retired New York businessmen and wealthy, retired Floridians. Truly, one can only wonder at the curious blend of people and circumstance that created this most unusual town. In the heart of summer, when the heat of their state became too much to bear, the tourists flocked to Hendersonville, swelling the population to a staggering 15,000. Yet, despite the constant influx of people, few knew of the buried treasure that lay just two miles from town. It was said to be worth millions on today's gold market and belonged to Abraham Kikendall, one of the county's wealthiest pioneers. The story had been passed down through the ages, but only a select few had ever dared to search for it. Frank L. Fitzsimons, the town's resident historian, had dedicated years to uncovering the truth behind the legend and had chronicled many of the town's tales in his books, From the Banks of the Okiowaha, Volumes 1 and 2. If one wished to visit Hendersonville, they need only write to the Chamber of Commerce office for brochures on accommodations and local historical sites. The curious blend of people and circumstance that created this most unusual town was truly a wonder to behold. As much as I share your sentiments, dear reader, I'm afraid that uncovering the treasure may require more than just a few fleeting days. Perhaps it could take weeks or even longer. However, it is worth noting that no one has ever searched the site with a metal detector, a fact that led me to believe that the pot of gold still lies there. Abraham Kuykendall, a brave member of the North Carolina militia during the Revolutionary War, settled south of Hendersonville before the year 1800. At that time, there were no towns in the area. It is interesting to note that when the locals talk of the war, they refer to the Revolutionary War, not the Civil War. Kuykendall was wealthy by 1800 and was granted several hundred acres of land in the Flat Rock area, which is now a small village located on Highway 25, also known as the Greenville Highway. The famous poet Carl Sandburg once lived in Flat Rock, and his old home is now a national monument located just a mile or so from Kuykendall's treasure site. The Pioneer Church, St. John, in the Wilderness, which was built in 1833, is also a historic building located nearby. Historian Fitzsimons conducted thorough research and discovered that the old Kuykendall property extended west from Highway 25 at Flat Rock past the Mud Creek Church area. Long ago, in the heart of Kuykendall's vast estate, a church was erected, and lo, the shrewd Kuykendall saw an opportunity to expand his empire. He built a blacksmith shop, a general store, an inn, and a tavern which became a popular stop for the weary travelers of the stagecoach. The southern lands were booming, and Kuykendall's establishment was a hub for those seeking their fortunes in the gold rush. Alas, the tavern and its companions have vanished, their location lost to time and progress. But the Mud Creek Baptist Church still stands, a testament to the dream of a rich pioneer who sought to build a community around his domain. Though Kuykendall's days are long gone, Legends persist that he lived well beyond his hundredth year. 
As the legend goes, Kaikendal was a man of great wealth before his demise. His original land grant was said to be around 600 acres, but he added several hundred more to it in later years. As the population of the Flat Rock area began to grow, Kuykendall amassed even more money by selling off parcels of his land to pioneers who wanted to be close to the nearest settlement. In those days, paper money was almost unheard of, and portable money came only in the form of gold, silver, and copper coins. There were no banks in rural North Carolina in those days, so Kikendall had to keep most of his wealth hidden or buried. One story goes that he had a young wife, and in his later years, he didn't quite trust her or like the way she was friendly to all the prospectors and single young pioneers who passed through town. Another version of the story doesn't mention the wife, but says that Kikendall had amassed so much coinage that he was beginning to worry about keeping it in or near his tavern. Whatever the reason, Kikendall buried a substantial sum of gold and silver, which is still believed to be buried north of Little River Road, not far from the center of Flat Rock, just about two miles south of Hendersonville. The treasure is said to be in a large iron wash kettle that was too heavy for him to lift alone. Late one night, Kuykendall summoned his two strongest house elves to his side. Blindfolding them and warning them not to ask any questions, he led them on a winding zigzag hike through the heavily wooded area south of Hendersonville. Crossing small creeks and turning them around multiple times, Kikendall made sure that the house elves had no idea where they were or what they were carrying. Eventually, he led them to a spot he had previously picked out and instructed them to dig a hole for an iron pot. Without a single question, the house elves completed their task, burying Kuykendall's treasure deep in the earth. With the gold and silver safely hidden, Kuykendall led the house elves back to his estate, their blindfolds still in place. The story ends with different variations, but all agree that the old man had hidden too much of his money and needed to retrieve some of it for a major purchase. Hogwarts students were known to have stumbled upon some of the strangest things, and the tale of Abraham Kikendall's buried treasure was no exception. The story goes that Kikendall had enlisted the help of several house elves to bury his pot of gold and silver, but he had never returned home from his expedition. Some say he tripped and fell into Pheasant Branch, while others claim he died while trying to give complicated directions to his sons. Regardless, his slaves had spoken of a strange hike in the woods, crossing creeks and seeing an old white oak tree at the treasure site. Despite several searches, the treasure remained elusive. But now, with the invention of metal detectors, perhaps a group of treasure hunters could have better luck in finding Kikendall's long-lost riches. I ventured out to the site a day before leaving Hendersonville last year, managed to track down the old Kikendall property and the two creeks where he paraded his slaves that fateful night. To find it yourself, take a southbound drive from town and turn right on Little River Road by the old Flat Rock Post Office. A few hundred yards down the lane, you'll cross a bridge over Memminger Creek. This is unlikely to be one of the creeks crossed that night, as it is too shallow to carry a crock of gold. About a mile down the road, you'll encounter the grandiose house on the right, known as the castle. Keep going for a while until Little River Road bends sharply to the left. If you keep going straight, you'll find a wide gravel lane branching off into three forks. The left goes to Mrs. Elizabeth Howe's residence, the center to WBW Howe's, and the right connects to Dr. Joe Bailey's. Between W. Howe's and Bailey's is a ravine holding Pheasant Branch. To the east, backtrack a few hundred yards and you'll come across Sally Capps Branch. Remember that the Kikendall Place is on flatland, in a meadow that still exists just south of Little River Road. The old white oak tree used as a marker by Kikendall is long gone, having been cleared by the lumber industry in the early 20th century. A good detector should easily pick up the shallow iron pot, a deep seeker, such as a two box or GEB, is recommended to cover more ground with less walking. The pot should create a GEB sound off at two to three feet, even if it's buried under a couple of feet of soil. If you plan to search the area, make sure to obtain permission first. Introducing yourself to the Howe and Bailey families and the locals might provide additional information on Kaikendall's buried treasure, which is estimated to weigh between 50 and 100 pounds of gold and silver.
If you're interested in purchasing a copy of this vintage magazine for yourself or as a gift for a friend or loved one, please click the link in the description.